Today's scripture is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. Now when the Son of Man comes in his majesty, and all his angels are with him, he will sit on his majestic throne. All the nations will be gathered in front of him. He will separate them from each other, just as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right, and the goats he will put on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who will receive good things from my Father, inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you before the world began. I was hungry, and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothes to wear. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then those who are righteous will reply to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you as a stranger and welcome you, or naked and give you clothes to wear? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? Then the kingdom will, king will reply to them, I assure you that when you have done it for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you have done it for me. God is still speaking. You have been paying attention. You might have two questions on your mind. Can you hear me now? Not from the mic. One more time. Okay. All right, this is, uh, okay. So, you might have two questions. First of all, first would have been what? What is that little ugly white thing is about on the altar? Uh, Are we collecting something today? And where is my robe? Right? I know some of you doesn't like me as much you know, doesn't like me as much without robe, right? Here's why. This is what I did. Excuse me, I have to use two hands, so. I've been talking, we're talking about spiritual disciplines. It all came from uh, my inspiration, from my getting my back health. So I, when I went to the therapy, I would do different things, you know, the stretching, the machines, and one of the weird things that therapist asked me to do, he would put, she would put this on the floor and put a 15 pound weight. And then I have to do, bend down, lift this up, and then there was a two, uh, uh, the, what do you call it, shelves. And I would put it in the one shelf, up shelf, down shelf, down. Put up, push it down, and I have to do it 15 times twice. And every two weeks, they're going to add five pounds more. And the goal was that I could do 35 pounds. Then I was sitting there, am I paying for this, really? Really? (laughs) 
Why did she do that? Because all the things that I needed to do at the therapy and now in, in the gym to strengthen my muscles, to have, you know, relieve my back pain and have in such a way, is not just to not have pain, but according to her, we are here to make you to function as best as you can so that you can do what you need to do. There went my excuse for not carrying the laundry bags from second floor to the basement. Ever since my back pain, I always say, I'm not supposed to lift anything. And she was saying, we want you to have a full life. It's not just to avoid pain. All those disciplines, purpose, was to help me to do what I needed to do. As a father, as a husband, as a neighbor, I used to uh, snow blow and shovel. And my neighbor, because I only have a snow blower, I used to blow my neighbor's uh, 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 sidewalk. For the last two years, I couldn't do it. The purpose of you know, discipline is not just for me, for me to do what I need to do to, what, to be what God want me to, want me to be and want me to do. That's the occupational therapy, right? This was occupational therapy. And spiritual discipline is like that. We've been talking about dis spiritual disciplines, prayers, fastings, keeping silence, meditations, reading scriptures, public worship. All these things in order, are there to help us to develop what we need to develop for a purpose. So that we can be what God wants us to be. All disciplines are there for us to love God and love others. That's what God wants us to do, right? All disciplines are there to help us to lift the things that we need to lift to love God and love others, to do the works of love and service. That's what spiritual discipline is all about. They are to help us to be like Jesus, to live and love like Jesus called disciples. There's no wonder why disciplines makes disciples. And that's what the purpose of our discipline. And the reason why my therapist asked me to do this instead of working on machine, because this is the best way for me to develop the muscles and things that is specifically required to do this work. No other machines can help me. So loving God and loving others, living and loving like Jesus is the purpose of our disciplines, then this is, these disciplines are best practiced in as real as possible. Like me lifting this up instead of, you know, the weights and other things. So this spiritual discipline of loving God and living, you know, loving others is best practiced in real relationships. You know, you cannot love others by just reading books and thinking about how, how much I'm going to love them. You cannot serve others by just having good intention. You actually put yourself in a position to exercise that disciplines of service, discipline of loving God and loving others. And how do we love God, which is the foundation of our, you know, Christian life? How do you love God? How do you love Jesus, who's not here, in a physical sense? I think Jesus worried about that, too, before his, you know, moving into, you know, God's residence. That's why we hear today's gospel. Jesus is talking about, rarely talking about, the final judgment. Sort of like who makes it, who doesn't make it, in an analogical sense, you know. And here Jesus is saying, what? Who, whatever you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. 
When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me in. When I was sick, you visited me. And people said, when did we do that? We never haven't seen you. I have met some boring pastor or insensitive employer or, you know, just troublesome neighbors or never listening children or just, you know, how do I say, unbearable husband. I met those people, but I've never met Jesus. And Jesus saying, whatever you have done to those who are the least of these, you have done to me. Jesus is saying, if you want to love me, then love these. Love others. That's why Jesus gave two great commandments, love God and love others. The only way we can love God is by loving others. And we cannot love others in a way that God wants us to love if we don't love God. That's simple cross math. And at the heart of this love is, in today's text, is a love for strangers. The biblical notion of love is, comes from more close to the notion of hospitality. Hospitality, in its root, means love for strangers. Its uh, root is found in Old Testament practices. Whenever the stranger comes into town, your tribe, even though you don't know them, and probably from other tribes or from maybe from other you know, nations, protocol is you are supposed to welcome them in, wash their feet, and provide them food. That was the Old Testament Hebrew idea of hospitality, love for strangers. No wonder why Jesus said, when I was a stranger, you took me in, you welcomed me in. Based upon this, St. Benedict said this, all guests to the monastery, when he started it, should be welcomed as Christ, because Christ will say, when I was a stranger, you took me in. And that was their rule, to practice to see every single person, especially the guest in a monastery, and treat them and value them and greet them and cherish them as if they are Jesus Christ, as if they are risen Christ who came to visit them. The Reverend Elizabeth Canham says this about this benediction rule. Benedict is basically saying, be here, find Christ in the restless teenager, demanding parents, insensitive employers, dull pastors, and lukewarm congregation. <laughs> Basically, find Christ in every single person. See, the love for others, love for strangers, has to be at the root of our all love. Loving God and loving others. Love for strangers. Because, think about it, who are the strangers? Whoever is not you, at what moment or the other, was a stranger to you, isn't it? Except yourself, all others are others. All relationships begin with someone other than you. Even if parenting, couples, at first, they were others. Members of the church, co-workers, citizens of the nations, they are all one, at one moment or others to you. Loving then means overcoming that otherness. And God's love is about overcoming that otherness that people insisted, called estrangement, the Garden of Eden, right? People wanted to get away, to be estranged from God, and God is pursuing them to overcome that. That's what love for stranger means. So Christian hospitality, therefore, means is to love others in a way to overcome that otherness, to narrow the gap. How? By seeing Christ in each person we meet. So what does this exactly mean? Loving stranger and seeing Christ in each person means accepting them as 
who they are, not who we want them to be. Do you think that you need to make change to Christ? Huh? Do you think you need to make change to Jesus? If you are to see Jesus Christ in each other, your first response would be what? Your first response shouldn't be, how am I going to judge that person? How am I going to measure that person up? You already, know, you already know Jesus Christ. So when Jesus said, see me in each person, when Benedict says, see Christ in each person, means when your, your first attitude of approaching others is that of humility. That this person is bringing gift of Christ to me regardless of who they are, regardless of situations. It, therefore, it means creating a space in us where the otherness of others, the strangeness of others, can be accepted, valued, truly and fully. It means accepting and valuing otherness and differences. What makes us feel strange at first it means accepting all those things in all relationships, at home, at work, at church, in our, and in society, and a nation. Speaking about otherness, when, you, when I got married, you know, when, when I got married to Yu Yan, I loved her, right? And it's been, it's going to be 19 years in two months. There are still things that I'm surprised how different she is. And it took 19 years and it's still going to accept that as it is. For the first few years, I struggled hard. Why couldn't she think like me? Why does she have to make decision that way? I wouldn't make decision that way. Even after all the years of courting and loving, we are different because God created us so. Loving your spouse, your partner, means accepting your spouse and partner's differences as they are. It's learning to do that. That's why it's not easy. Parenting, think about it, parenting. You would not like the idea. No, my child is not a stranger to me. Yes, they are. Especially as they grow older. They're going to be at some point more stranger to you than you want to admit. And parenting is about what? Allowing them to be who they are destined to be. Which is also hard because we all have dreams and expectations. Church is the same place. This is not a place that we come to agree on every matter. This is the place where we come to love one another, accept one another, even though that person really takes me off. Even though that pastor preaches too long. Even though we sing sometimes not so lovely hymns. Doesn't matter because that's how we welcome each other as the bearer of Christ. It also means asking, therefore, loving stranger means asking whether people are accepted, welcomed, valued, and dignified like Christ by our world with all their differences. That's hospitality means. It's suspending my own judgment to accept others and making sure that all people are accepted like that. That's Christian love. That's what practice of hospitality means. Living our lives in a way to imagine and work for a world where no one remains as strangers to nobody. That's hard. Especially these days, it's even harder. Our political rhetorics, discourses, atmosphere seems trying harder to make a world where people become strangers to 
more people become strangers to one another. All this talk about, you know, generalizing good Muslims and Islam, all the phobias, the violence at the rallies because simply they don't agree with one another. And inciting those things are against the vision of God, against the way of hospitality. The prejudice and violence against differences, race, gender, religion, and sexual orientation, you name it. Those are the places where we are called to lift up, to create a space. All these people are accepted, regardless of who they are, what they believe, or who they love. This is why we cannot practice this hospitality. Spiritual disciplines of hospitality cannot be practiced in a vacuum. It cannot be practiced in, you know, in the attic. It cannot be practiced in the prayer room. Yes, we need to pray, all those things, but it's a preparing for us to go out on the streets, in our homes, in our workplaces, in this church, and in our nation. We have to go and start to do some lifting. And you know what? One secret of exercise getting health, and what my eight years ago original physical therapist told me, do have this principle. Learn to know where your limit is at each stage. So he said, whenever I ask you to do lift 10 times, make sure that about six times, relatively easy. And then seven, eight, nine, ten, it gets harder and harder. So by the time you do the tenth lifting or tenth pushing or tenth, you know, lifting or pulling, nine and tenth, you feel like, you know, oh, it might gonna break me a little bit. It's too hard. Maybe it makes your heart, you know, heart goes a little faster. That's the way to do it. If you don't feel the pain, if you don't feel the discomfort, if you don't feel the weight, you wasted your time. Secret of discipline is knowing the difference. He said, you never do it 10 times like as if it's going to take your breath and life away. But aim it in such a way that you will push it a bit and bit a bit. Practicing hospitality means putting ourselves in that place. Because that's how we'll make our spiritual muscle grow, the muscle to love God and love others. Let me end this, with this story. Some 10 years ago, I was, I think I've shared with you one time or the other. 10 years ago, I was attending this big conference, Methodist conference that happens every four years. About 1,500 leaders from all over the world, Methodist pastors, lay peoples, clergy, uh, laity, the bishops, they gather for training for four days. I was there in Houston, Texas. Hilton of Americas, it's a huge hotel. I've never seen it, such a huge hotel. And all these towers. And in the morning, they only have, you know, unless you go to the big restaurant, which is so expensive, you have to get it, you know, like a vendor type. We had 1,500, there are two other conferences going on. You had to wait 30 minutes in line to get bagel and coffee. So from my beautiful view of my room on the ninth or 10th floor, I saw the Golden Arch. <laughs> it's like a you know, mirage calling me. So, so I see these people saying, oh, they don't know. It looked like a couple of blocks. So I went out one morning, walked toward about a three quarters of a mile, went through about six, eight blocks. And I was shocked. Whole city of Houston was surrounded by homeless. There is this, the highway, the elevated highway, underneath it was thousands and thousands of homeless. And McDonald's was right at the center of it. So I went there to get a 
breakfast. I got the breakfast because I was in this posh, wonderful hotel looking at these high rises and all the oil monies and great cities. And underneath and shade of it were people hungry. We came home and we had this, you know, event where a preacher came, what Methodism was all about, what original Methodists did was to feed the hungry, you know, educated the children, you know, help the uh, uh, widows to get economically independent, all these things. And we were supposed to have this banquet, closing banquet at evening. Methodist conference have no money, so we only have one banquet on four days. Now there is no banquet at all. That was 10 years ago, good time. So there was a banquet that was supposed to be. We were supposed to have communion. In that communion, we were supposed to sing this new hymn saying, you know, while we feast sumptuously on our table, not knowing the hungry go by in our neighbor, something like that. So when I read that, this, I saw where those neighbors were. So I approached the, you know, uh, 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 the leader saying, can, can, I, can we make an announcement that people, Seek a volunteers, we'll go to lunch to McDonald's. And we'll get two meals, one for you and one for the homeless. And let's just practice what we've been talking about. And then we said, we're going to invite those people to our banquet. And we'll give up our meal because it's all headcount. 150 people, you know, volunteered. 150 of us went out. Out of that 150, there was a lay leader, grandmother from New Jersey. Because I know, because she came with my friend pastor. And before we going, she shared the concern with me. She's a good Methodist, lifelong Christian. That's why she was there. And she said, I have never met a homeless in direct circumstances. And she was saying how you know, this discomfort and fear that she has. She was moved by the Spirit, so she raised her hand. Now reality starts to kick in that she has to walk and be that places that, she, that only existed in her perception as the place of discomfort, you know, and fear. So she wanted to pa pray with her pastor and me, and we talked about it. She said, you'll be going with a lot of people, and the moment you feel discomf discomfort or dangerous, you can always pull back. She was one of 150 people. We went down there. I invited them, saying, you will only ask to do two, right? So spend 10 bucks. When we started to do that, the word spread out. It took, it didn't take a minute. Suddenly, our homeless friends started to line up. So we were supposed there for an hour, sharing meals, having conversations. We were there for three hours, served about 430 hamburgers. That McDonald had no idea. 150 people spent over $2,000 out of pocket right there. Because we couldn't say no. And we issued them invitation to come to our banquet. About 100 of them came. Hilton of Americas. 100 homeless folks. And there were some, you know, security people doing it, all these things. So they were came, uh, there was a boy who was shining shoes. The families were homeless. Two of them came and the, shone the shoes, about 200 of pairs. We sat and shared the meal, had a communion, served one another. I visited that grandmother. She said, this was the best day of my faith. And then, we were talking to our friends. We were collecting money because they had to walk two, three miles to go back to their camp, different places. We wanted to get a cab or van. And they all came out and said, no. You guys have done enough for us today. We don't need any more money. Walking is what we do well. So they didn't receive the money. They all walked. And one person said, grabbed my hand, and said, 
this was a good day because I've never been wanted as a person like this for a long, long time. That's what spiritual, the practice of hospitality means. Making people feel wanted by God's grace. And by doing so, you are enriched, just like that grandmother, just like that me. That's the place of my sacred memory. I wish every Methodist event would be like that. You know, maybe we'll go bankrupt, but who knows? But that's what the practice can happen, and it, you can do it. Because you will walk by every street. You will have neighbors. Go to home. Now see Christ in your husband or wife or your partners. Accept and value your children as if they are Christ. And in this church, that's what we are supposed to do. Love me like you love Jesus. I'll do, love you, like Jesus. And we will all know the gift of salvation. Let us stand and sing. <laughs>